yourself, <clears throat> and then we'll uh, go around the room, and you guys will introduce yourselves very briefly. And you'll tell me one thing that you know about administrative law. So people who go first, they won't be there. Um, <clears throat> how many people took administrative law uh, in law school? Yeah, so a bunch of you are public law. Preparing the public law, like in England, a lot of you guys went to school in England, right? They don't include much about admin law, is that? That's right. Anyway. So, yeah, back to, back to me. Um, I am uh, Assistant Commissioner with the Information and Privacy Commissioner of Ontario. It's an Ontario um, agency uh, that deals with FOI privacy, and, our, and we have uh, three statutes that we operate under and we're um, we're what I'm gonna refer to a lot as a DM so I'm gonna use that term DM you guys are going to use it for decision maker you know we make decisions but you're gonna learn about how um, we have all kinds of different decision makers in the administrative law system in Ontario and federally um, anyway so that's that so a little bit more about me so um, I started, uh, after I graduated from Western Law, yay, um, I did uh, civil litigation for a couple of years. I really hated it. Uh, personal injury, no offense to anyone who's doing that. <laughs> uh, decided to move on and enjoy um, an almost like brand new office, this tribunal called the Information Privacy Commissioner. And I've been there ever since, so I've been there about 30 years. Um, a lot of experience with different kinds of um, you know roles at this office and uh, started off as legal counsel and uh, became director of legal I also did adjudication so another word that we're going to throw around a lot uh, so I was a decision, decision maker and uh, then eventually I became assistant commissioner so that's that's where I'm at now um, but also I should mention that, that in my role as legal counsel uh, I did a lot of judicial reviews. You guys know what judicial review is? Uh -huh. So um, I've got a fair bit of experience on the judicial review side, defending um, the decisions of our office. Uh, and, you know, I dealt with pretty much all the issues that we're going to talk about um, in this class. Any more, any questions about me, my background? Okay, cool. Um, you guys can introduce yourselves, um, and then, then I guess what I'll do is I'll go through the syllabus a little bit, um, so, you know, I can answer any questions and I'll just give you a bit of a, a you've, you've seen the, the course outline, uh, but I'll, I'll walk through a couple of the, the key points, okay? So, who wants to start? Let's start in the back. Alexis. I am, um, I need glasses. And um, a little bit about the district law. It's a branch of public law. Yeah. Um, I was working with public programs. Great. You only did one thing. Very good. You got it. Uh, where did you go to law, to law school? I went to University of Boston. Boston. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Zoya. Uh, my name is Zoya. I went to the University of Boston, and I had a couple of yeah, yeah, great. So is Lester just like over with Canadian? Is that yeah, it's yeah, like exactly. maybe Canada? Yeah. At least at the uh, university. Say yeah. so, yeah, uh, Harder. I'm from Lester. Alright. Um and this is my first time. First time? Yeah. yeah. Okay. After today you're gonna be able to tell me one thing. You're going to retain one thing, at least one thing for tonight. Uh, Kanika. Yeah, hi. I'm Kanika. Yeah. So I did my law from National University. And uh, so a little bit of administrative law is basically um, review different administrative procedures and uh, like review, review, and review. You nailed it. So st standard of review, substantive review is one of the, the, like the two big areas that we're going to be covering we're going to be spending a lot of time on that but before we do that we're going to spend a lot of time on 
a different area. Anybody know what that is? Procedural fairness. The procedural fairness. Right on. Procedural fairness. Yeah, these are kind of the big two um, areas that we're going to explore. So in a way, admin law kind of boils down to, to two critical things, procedural fairness and uh, substantive review. That will become more clear later. Okay. New person. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Just introduce yourself and tell me one thing you know about admin law. <laughs> that is a three. Like, I just got here. Yeah. Uh, my name is uh, uh, Evgenia or Jenia, uh, uh, and I'm from Russia. And um, one thing I was surprised when I was uh, preparing for the class today uh, is that um, here administrative law seems to encompass so many areas, whereas yeah. in Russia, Administrative law is viewed kind of in a narrow sense. It's okay. only what's mm, covered in the code of administrative violations. So it's just the penal section. Oh, it's learn. quite narrow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kiana, and I came from China. So uh, this course is my first course in this program. So um, uh, for me, I think the committee administrative law is um, is related to public and government. But it will influence to each person in the society. Yeah, for sure. Okay, thank you. All right, who's next? Yeah, um, my name is uh, Xiaonan Cao. Uh, this is my last term uh, in this program. Last term, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm, uh, actually, I, I'm not um, in the, um, with the uh, admin's law. <laughs> I don't know, um, um, but I'm, but I'm uh, interested in, uh, in this class and uh, hope to know some. Yeah, you'll, you're going to know a lot by the time you're Thank finished. You. <laughs> <laughs> by the time we're finished with you, you're going to be an expert. All of you are going to be experts. I hope so. <laughs> Absolutely, and you're going to say, I love it, mid law. It's like the best area of law ever. Okay, yeah. next. So my name is Joel. And yeah, this is also my last term. This I I'm more familiar with the IRB because <coughs> I work for immigration law. Firm. IRB. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. The okay, immigration yeah. refugee board. So I went to uh, immigration division, like with my boss, for the detention review and for the uh, administ administrative hearing. Yeah. Right. So I think I can, um, I wish that I can learn more. <laughs> You've been to federal court. No. No. Uh, most of our job was to submit the application okay, for the PR yeah. application, so yeah. few opportunity to go to the federal court. Right. Yeah. yeah, doesn't happen very often. Uh, next. Hi, my name is Sue, and the way I have for administrative law is what I heard it's so complete, like complex, and it's oh, hard. It's <laughs> we told you that. <laughs> and like, I so would have easy. to remember a lot of systems, different systems, and yeah. different like <coughs> days. And yeah. um, it's independent from the um, legal system, so they make decisions by themselves. So I was like, <laughs> like court, independent yeah. from the court system. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. I'm oh, sorry, I don't have the name. No, no, you can. Okay. I'm myself a representative of mine. Uh, so my name is Bashir. I went to University of Leicester, like uh, my colleagues, and uh, yeah, uh, about administrative law deals with um, decisions relating to the public public bodies. So that's a little bit of work. Yeah, yeah. So that's right. Very good. Thank you. Uh, hi. My name is Yang Kui and I come from China. And uh, I, I did an intellectual property before coming to here. So and the ministry of law is very new for me. And I think it's the law governs the relationship between the government and the person. And uh, I think also it's similar to constitutional law, I guess. Yeah, yeah there's some, definitely some um, connections to constitutional law. We're going to learn about that. But you'll be happy to know we're not going to talk very much about okay. constitutional law on the charter. A little bit. Allison. Hi, my name's Allison. I went to university in France. Um, and I have a question about the law or even British law, but I did do one class in the Ministry of Law in France, and yeah. it's all about expropriation, apparently. So expropriation? Yes, yeah, okay. in the Wow. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, this is a lot bigger. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Hi. University of Southampton. Um, all I know about an in-law is it's considered the hardest class we're going to take. <laughs> People say that. I had faith in you, though. It, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Must have faith in you, because it's going to be fun and easy, as I said. By the time I'm finished with you guys, perfect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so my name's uh, Obad. I went to University of Birmingham. And uh, one thing about admin law is that it's about keeping public bodies in check. Yeah, very good. Hi, I'm Ryan. I study law at the University of Edinburgh. And I'm thinking about admin law. I was reading that there is a important battle between Dicean and functionalist schools of thought. Wow. That have had. Very. It's good. <laughs> that's, what, that's what the textbook said. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good. You got into the philosophical end of things. Very nice. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Nadab, and I went to the University of Kent. And uh, basically, Admin law like controls the way in which uh, decision making has been decentralized by the government. Yeah, yeah. very good. Thank you. Uh, my name's Simon. I went to law school at the University of York, not York University, University of York. University of York. Yeah, in the UK. <laughs> and then, so it's um, not on the subway line. <laughs> no, it was a very easy to yeah. But um, one thing about admin law is that they have independent, independent like agencies. Uh, that um, are more specialized than regular ones. Yeah, right on. Good one. Hi. My name is Anna. Hi. Um, I this is my final course in my program. So nice. Yes. <laughs> I went to law school in England at the University of London. Uh, I actually work at the Financial Services Regulatory Authority. So. I oh, work okay. At a <laughs> Feder it's, is that federal? It. No, it's provincial. It used to be fiscal. Okay, yeah. Yes, and then it's right. now. So it's Ontario. Yeah. Yes, uh, I work <coughs> in the market conduct division uh, overseeing life insurance companies. Oh, okay. Yes. So are you a decision maker? Yes. You are? Somewhat. All right. We have, we have a real live DM here. <laughs> Somewhat. That's great. Thank you. Jill. Hi, I'm Jill. I went to, well, I didn't go, I did online with the <coughs> University of London. And uh, I remember all sorts of wonderful things from that main course, like. Uh, dimes and Pinochet for having an interest, those were two, and Glamorgan and Aylesbury Mushroom for not following the process. There, it stuck with me four years later. Oh, very good. I'm shocked. Procedural fairness. Yes, yes. yes. Okay. I'm Chris Alain from Brazil, and uh, one thing that bothers in Michigan as well, um, uh, there is a later, latest debate uh, after the case of Dunsmore that has changed the standards of appeal before it was chapter 3. And now the reasonable sequence there has been revoked, and now we just have the reasonableness and un I don't know the other one. But <laughs> yeah, that's one. Anybody remember the other one? Correctness. Reasonableness and correctness. Oh, yeah, good, yeah. good. Now you got it. Thank you. Hi. Hi. My name is Amalia. I'm from Greece. So I went there for law school. And one thing that I, this is my kind of course as well. <laughs> and the one thing that I know from administrative law is that uh, the power of the administ uh, administrative uh, decision maker is not impaired. Very good. Yeah, another important principle we're going to talk about. Yeah, and finally? Uh, hi, my name is Helena, and this is my very first course. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, I'm from Russia, so I'm from Civil and I used yeah. to work for. Uh, Russian Foreign Ministry and Consul General of Russian Toronto, and I'm oh, wow. working as an event system for the Immigration Offer. Right. So I'm very involved in the ministry here. Okay. Yeah, you're, you're right in there with it, yeah. in the immigration context. Yeah. yeah. Great. The one thing which is interesting for me is the extent to which the uh, administrative bodies are actually independent and from the government. Right. And that's an uh, issue in Russia as well. Yeah, really interesting area of law that we're going to talk about, for sure, yeah. Okay, thank you. We got through that pretty quickly. Well done. Um, so what's next? Let's talk about the uh, course outline a little bit. Um, 
So we know in terms of marking, we always want to talk about marking. 70% for the exam, the final exam, which is in uh, December 18th. And we're going to have a midterm that's worth 20%. And that's going to be like a take home assignment that's handed out on October 23rd do November 6th, so you have a couple of weeks uh, to complete that. And uh, we can talk about that later. Not so important right now, but just so you know that's coming. And 10% um, <clears throat> of your mark is class participation. So I encourage you always to, to speak up and uh, kind of join the discussion as we go. So any questions about um, the syllabus. And it, you know, I'm, it was pretty clear about what we're covering uh, every week uh, with, you know, the different slide decks, um, just as far as the schedule goes. So we have, you know, the six weeks, six classes of slide decks, um, seven actually. And then uh, week eight and week nine are both um, kind of open. I decided to do that to uh, give you lots of time um, to do exam prep. We can do practice questions, things like that, uh, which will, I think will help you a lot. Um, and we we may do some other fun things. Who knows? We'll see as we go. Um, well, I've been teaching this for about five years now, so I've had lo lots of um, groups like you guys, so lots of experience. Um, but uh, let me know. If you have any questions, or you, there's some, you want more of something, or less of something, or anything like that, um, let me know. Uh, we've got the, the textbooks, the two textbooks. Uh, this one, we refer to often as the, the case book. Uh, this one's uh, heavy, not just physically heavy, it is physically heavy. But it it's, um, can be harder to read. Um, this one, I think, in many ways is more helpful. Uh, a little, I don't know if you've been doing the readings already, but you probably noticed that it is a little easier and explains things in a little more straightforward way. Um, so, you know, I, I would definitely put kind of more emphasis on the pink book. If you're pressed for time, you don't, you don't have time to do all the readings. Um, that's, that's where I would go. And I, you know, I also say like the sl my slides are an indication of what's important. You know, so if I if I put a case in the slides, that means you know it's got some significance. Um, you know, I'm not really all about oh there was a case referred to in the book and I never mentioned it in my slides and you know that's going to be the key case. I I wouldn't really do that. So um, the slides are, are really important. No questions? I, have I knew okay. somebody would have. Have you any chance that we can get the assignment during the break? Because I have a month break in this course. When's the break? It's oh, the, oh, our break, the break that we have. Yeah. The crazy break. From 11, September 11 to October 16. Yeah, well, I'm sorry. First of all, I'm sorry about that, but that was just my schedule that I had to work around. Yeah. We, do, we do have a long break. Um, the problem with that. Uh, is you won't really have all the the law that you need yet. So yeah, I, it kind of has to work that way, but I understand when you look at the schedule, it, kind of, it wouldn't make sense. But you won't be in a position yet to answer the question because it's going to be a procedural fairness question. We know that already. Um, and the first part of the, you know, a few classes are all about procedural fairness. Uh, I think even a little bit tonight. So. That's how we're going to do it. Um, as far as like breaks and so forth, um, typically, I don't know, I'm not big on just like having like a predetermined time to break. I'm thinking like 7, 7.30 around that time. We'll have roughly a 15 minute break and then go to the end. Um, I, I don't always go right to the end, to 10 o'clock. It's a long night. Yeah. I think you kind of stop learning after the 9.30. So, you know, don't be surprised if, if we end a bit early. Um, yeah. Anything else?
Uh, Sorry, will we know our participation grade before the final exam? No. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, I've never, never had that question. No, I, I'll sort of evaluate at the very end. Um, it's not worth a whole lot, but if, if you have any concerns about how you're doing, let me know. You know, let me know as we go along. Um, yeah. So, uh, instead of the big one, I have the grade usually. Is it like A or there's no? Yeah, the page numbers are going to be a okay, bit off. Yeah. But otherwise, I mean, the content is okay. fine. You just might get a bit lost as to. No, I mean, what's the you, on the Yeah, page. yeah, that should work. Okay. Let me know if, if you're having trouble with that. Yeah, so some people will have the older, the older book. The green one's green, green, right? The green one, yeah. Okay. Ready to have some fun? Yeah. <laughs> I see that in the first slide is like really boring. Okay, well, because I, I just want to introduce, you know, the idea of well, what is it mid law? We've already talked about it a little bit. Definitional stuff. Um, really, and really all tonight is getting you used to um, the terminology that we use. Like what is it mid law? And what's what are the um, the words and phrases that, that we use to describe the concepts in administrative law? You've already learned one, DM, right? Decision maker. And there's a few others that I'm gonna I'm gonna be comfortable with. Because a lot of it in law is it's you know the the cases and the statutes and the judges use really weird terms that are not intuitive. So it's going to take a while for you to understand what it is they're talking about when they use certain terms. So I'm going to highlight those for you and kind of drill them into you until you're just sick of it. Um, but so I'm going to do that over and over. And tonight is sort of really about that, about getting used to um, the language, really, of it being law. Again, which is really weird, and I think it's a big reason why people hate it because you know we have these these phrases like. Standard of review. Does anyone even know what that means? Some of you might. Most people, when you say standard of review, they have no idea what you're talking about. Then you try to explain it, and they still don't have any idea what you're talking about. So we're going to have to go over it and over it and over it until it really um, has a strong meaning for you. So we'll get there. Okay. What is it, Minbaugh? Sarah Blake. Administrative law is the law that governs public officials and tribunals. So tribunals, DMs, public officials, these are all sort of terms that we use in the same way. Kind of. uh, so you could say the law that governs DMs, decision makers, who make decisions that affect the interests of individual persons and whose authority to make those decisions is derived from statute. Administrative law prescribes the rules by which these authorities are expected to operate, and when these rules are not complied with, provides the complaint procedure and the remedies. Okay, that's kind of bad. You have a question already on slide one? Yeah, I do. Okay. Um, do you have any idea why the officials or DMs are called members in so many cases? That just seems odd. I'm just curious. Yeah, members is a, another common term. Yeah like a tribunal member. See, they throw around all these words, and they could be because they're written in the statute, or sometimes not, they just call them that. Adjudicator, member, referee, that's on a later slide, but there's all these different words. And, you know, again, a big part of admin law is going, but, you know, you'll read this story and you'll say, who are these people? Like, what's a referee, you know? You think about sports. Or a member, or what's that supposed to be? Like a member of a club? What is that? Yeah. So again, we're gonna, we're gonna go over that, and we're gonna um, sort of know when to spot. Okay, uh, I know what they mean. They mean a DM mm -hmm. member. DM. Are there any fine law hairspring distinctions, or is it just that bottom no. term and that one uses? No, we don't care. We don't care. The point is that we're talking about a person or a group of people that have a some kind of power under a statute to do something, right? So these are ordinary people who, because of some statute, um, gain this superpower to be a DM, or a member, or a referee, or an adjudicator. 
to when you mentioned the derived from statute, does it have to always be derived from a statute? Can yeah. there not be yeah. a situation like So that? these DMs, they, they're nothing without a statute. There's always a statute. No, it, we, we're, we're not going to we're not going to talk about that. Royal prerogative is something um, you know decision making powers that the government has, but and we are going to talk about it at one point very narrowly. But leave that aside, shove that aside. What we're really talking about in mid law is people who have a power power to do something under a statute. There's always a statute out there somewhere that gives them power. There are people just kind of floating around with all these powers, never mind prerogative. Um, they're always tied back to the statute. I get power, when I was an adjudicator, I had power given to me under a statute. And that says what I can do, gives me powers, decision-making powers. Okay, don't worry if you don't think you're lost already. We're gonna go back to that. <clears throat> so here's another uh, attempt to describe you know, what is it in law or defined in law? law? Administrative law deals with the remedies available to a person affected by administrative action. In our system in Canada, the government has no special rights or powers, but derives all of its authority, oh, there you go, either from statute or from rights or powers of the royal prerogative, forget royal prerogative for now. They get their powers from statutes. Uh, much of administrative law involves determining the precise ambit of the powers which the legislatures have granted to a particular statutory delegate. Okay, so there's a statute out there that gives somebody power to do something, and it's our job as administrative law lawyers to look at the statute and say, well, you can do this, but you can't do that. You know, you, you've done something you can't do, you don't have the power to do that or the statute says you're supposed to do something, then you, you have to do it. So the statute rules, right? And in then law, the statute rules. Unlike judges, right? Who have inherent powers. We'll talk about that too. So that's a huge difference. Judges have these inherent powers they can do. You know, they can, uh, if the judge doesn't like my face, he can block me up. He or she can block me up. Really, I'm exaggerating, but they have all these inherent powers, not these DMs. DMs can only do what the statute says they can do. That's it. The statute rules. Maybe, maybe a bit of overkill there, but okay. Um, so let's look at some everyday example examples of administrative decision makers, DMs, tribunals. We've already heard there are a couple of people here who know a lot about this uh, DM, the Immigration and Refugee Board. Of course, deal with immigration matters. Uh, Board of Referees, ridiculous name, that's what they're called. So they deal with employment insurance benefits, but there's another DM, right? College of Physicians and Surgeons, what do they do? Well, they deal with, uh, you know, uh, pe people having licenses to practice medicine. Law Society of Upper Canada, we deal with people having a license to practice law. Oh, they're not called that anymore. Who's? Yeah. Don't report me. <laughs> Law Society of Ontario. Uh, Landlord and Tenant Board. Anybody familiar with that? Yes. Yeah. Pr probably not for a good reason. <laughs> you know, fight with the landlord, but you are a landlord. Uh, is that Ontario or federal? Yeah. Right, okay, so here's, an, I'll make this other point is that for us in this class, uh, all our DMs are either Ontario DMs or federal DMs. How do you know? Which one they are? How do you know? Does Section 91 relate to the Constitution? Well, it's more straightforward than that. Oh, okay. Does it somehow depend on the split of the powers in the Constitution? Oh, yeah, yeah, you're making the same point. No, no, it's no. it's easier than that. How do you know? Yeah, look at the statute. Is it, a, is it a federal statute or a provincial statute? It gives them power, right? Because they don't exist without their statute. So if it's an Ontario statute that gives them power to do something, then it's an Ontario DM. 
And if it's a federal statute that gives them the power, they're a federal to get. And they're two separate worlds. So don't get them mixed up. Because you need to know, for example, if it's a federal DM and you make a decision, who's made a decision that you don't like, you need to know where where you're going to go, right? What court are you going to go to to challenge them? Don't go in the wrong court. It's happened. People do it. Um, you have to know to go to the right court. If it's a federal DM making a decision, you want to challenge that on judicial review. What courts do you go to? Federal court. Yes. Very good. It's a provincial DM, Ontario provincial DM. What court do you go to on judicial review? Because it's not divisional. You're kind of right. You're both right. It's divisional court, which is part of the Superior Court. But we say divisional court. But you're right because it's part of Superior Court. The full name is Ontario Superior Court of Justice, brackets, divisional court. Yeah. Very technical. Thing that we're not going to worry about for now. Uh, labor arbitrators, the Ontario Labor Relations Board, of course, these are DMs that deal with employment and labor matters. CRTC, regulation of telecommunications. The Human Rights Tribunal deals, of course, with human rights issues. The Ontario Racing Commission deals with horse racing. Ontario Securities Commission Securities Regulation. So look, you know, look at that. Look at what a broad area of life in Canada. Our D, um, administer, administrative DMs deal with. So, in terms of our whole justice system in Ontario and Canada, courts are basically nothing. These people are way more important. These DMs are like this, courts are like this. Of course, courts get on TV all the time, so we think you know they're really important, but they're not. They're not important. The, that's why admin law is so great. <laughs> it's so important. Because these DMs can affect our lives so much more than any court really could. I'm selling it, I'm selling it here. I don't know if you're buying it. Okay. Where does the authority come from to make a decision? We touched on this. Um, where do elected officials drive their authority? Where do judges drive their authority? Those people are different about what we say about our people, administrative decision makers. They don't have any inherent jurisdiction to do anything. Um, they have to look to their legislation for authority, right? So I want to always emphasize that, that it's always back to the statute, right? And without that, and it, unless their statute says they can do something, they can't do anything at all. Um, but that also means that they have to, they, they have to act within their authority. They can't go outside their authority. We talked about that a lot. Why do we have or why do we need administrative uh, decision makers? I should ask you guys to guess, but I'll throw this one up there. Impartiality, freedom from the political process. Anybody know what, what that means? Somebody explain why that would be important. I think that's why they're saying that it's like independence from government. Yeah. And that's why they have to appointed or voted. So, yeah, government, but why, or even political, right? So why not have um, the Ontario legislature, who's you know ruled by a certain political party? Why not have them make decisions? Not right? Didn't vote for them uh, for elections because they want to make decision makers to use influence Yeah, yeah. Would you trust an MPP, uh, a group of three MPPs, to make a decision about you? <laughs> <laughs> People laugh. It's like, no, no way. Uh, and why? Because of the, the political problem. Because they're, they're political actors. And they're going to look at you and say, well, what's best for my re-election chances? I'm going to say yes, because I'll, maybe that will help me get re-elected, because you'll be happy. Or the other way around. 
I don't like you because you, I know you're, you know, you favor some other political party, so you lose. You know, we don't, we don't want to put our fate in the hands of, of politicians for these kinds of decisions, right? Also, the DMs have more uh, specialized uh, knowledge to put yeah. certain aspects. Yeah, exactly. Very good. And that's here, expertise. The third bullet, expertise. Uh, do you know? Does it, your typical MPP know landlord and tenant issues inside and out? I doubt it. Highly unlikely. So yeah, we want DMs who really know their stuff in whatever area we're talking about. Like all the areas we, we just mentioned on the previous slide. Um, efficiency. There's always like a large volume of cases, so then like it's not very efficient to like have them all go through like a single court. Yeah, exactly. So you can imagine, I told you that the, the, the number of cases that are administered law cases, is like, it's gotta be like a hundred times that of the number of cases that go to court, right? So imagine this big wave of cases. Oh, okay, everything's going to the courts now. What do you think would happen? What's that? It'd be like Brazil. It'd be like Brazil. You want to live in Brazil? Well, actually, maybe they do. Um, yeah, we'd probably be waiting years for decisions, right? Because we know how long, how, how long it takes to get to court, even for a simple matter. It can take years, right? In Canada, we're kind of hopeless. Other countries do better, but we're not very good here in Canada uh, in terms of our courts. So we say, okay, let's get let's get this stuff out of the courts and into these DMs. Let them decide, and then they can decide more quickly. Because again, we know how long it takes to get um, <clears throat> to get to a court and get before a judge. And how often have you ever have you ever seen a judge decide like on the spot? Huh. Anybody have any <laughs> experience with judges? You know, like you argue the case and then they say, okay, you win, you lose. Goodbye. Does that ever happen? It does, but very rarely. <laughs> Only on TV, yeah, in law and order it happens. Yeah. I think there is also that idea that decision makers should be closer to those impacted by that particular area. So judges are, you know, more far removed from. Yeah, no, right? that's a good Subject point. Parent. Um, they're far removed, I guess, in different ways. We think of them as being sort of these super smart people that we look up to and we bow before them and all that. With DMs, um, not so much. They're, they, you make a good point. They tend to be more, and I don't, you know, want to make this sound negative, but they're more like ordinary people. So I, I think you definitely make a good point there. Uh, people that you can probably we can relate to more than we can to judges. Flexibility. What? What could I mean by that? What's? Well, and we're comparing courts to administrative tribunals. Um, I can give you two different answers, but one of them is that they're not uh, locked into the same rules in terms of ethical governance as. Uh, very good. Yeah. Judge Walker would be. Yeah. And uh, I think the courts are moving maybe a little bit in this direction, but I, as I understand it, the um, tribunals are a lot more adaptive of things like teleconferencing and exactly. Things, and the courts <coughs> are a little bit behind in that regard. Yeah. Again, if you've ever uh, experienced going to the court, if you wrote a letter to the judge, say, "Hey, judge, why don't we do this one by Skype?" <laughs> what do you think? It, what do you think they're going to say? They will laugh and say, "Yeah, we don't we don't do that." But there's all kinds of tribunal hearings who um, that take place online uh, or have you know more unusual procedures or um, creative different kinds of procedures to maybe be quicker or easier for the parties. Or written here. How about a written here? Happens all the time. In administrative law, it does happen before courts, but it's pretty rare. It's usually on really simple matters. What Normally, it's an in-person hearing, right? In court. 
you're there. You're standing there before the judge. Uh, DM, administrative DMs don't have to do that. They don't have to have in-person hearings. What's the answer with the issue in Baker was that it wasn't an in-person hearing? Well, that was, yeah, that was written. That's yeah, true. Yeah, that's the point. It was written. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to leave discretion alone for now. Okay. Uh, so, a lot of what we talk about in Min Law, and this is sort of a, a bit of a conceptual framework I want you guys to think about. Of two great principles coming into clash with each other, one being uh, parliamentary supremacy based on democracy and responsible government versus rule of law. Um, it's a little hard to explain right now, but the, these are the two principles that are sort of constantly in the background when we talk about in in law um, problems or issues. When we talk about procedural fairness, when we talk about substantive review, we kind of have the uh, clash of these two principles and kind of a, we're always trying to find a balance between the two. Uh, I thought this would lighten things up a little bit. King Kong versus Godzilla, which I think is going to be, a, there's a new one, I believe. That's an old movie. Um, but we think uh, parliamentary supremacy and rule of laws like King Kong versus Godzilla, uh, in the sense of they're, they're constantly battling one another. You can never think of, neither one can, get, neither one can kill the other. They just kind of fight till eternity. At one point, King Kong will have the upper hand, you know, parliamentary supremacy, and then later, Godzilla will have the upper hand, rule of law. Um, but you can never, they're so powerful that they can never be eliminated, and they're battling through through time in a middle. We're going to come back to that and we'll talk about, get deeper into some of the principles. <clears throat> Okay, and don't worry if you don't understand that now. It'll be coming for it. Okay, back to sort of real life. Um, I thought I'd throw a couple of interesting examples, scenarios that, that are that raise admin law questions um, that are actually based on you know real real cases. So the first one. A horse jockey in the Ontario horse racing industry loses his license to participate. The decision to revoke the license is made by the Ontario Racing Commission, or what do we call it? What do we call the Ontario Racing Commission in our world? It's the short form. DM. DM, yeah. So the jockey disagrees with the decision. What can he do? Sort of rhetorical question, but but I mean it depends on what the reason for his dis disagreement is. Exactly. So I like I always go back to this, and and let's use that as kind of a a touchstone. So think of it as you guys are practicing in Min Law. You're Min Law lawyers, and for whatever reason, the jockey heard about you and comes to you in tears. You know, I lost my license, and they throw, you know, something like this at you. Just they throw a piece of paper at you or a bundle of paper, and it's a decision. So it's a, a decision they just read, um, and they lost their license. So now the question is to you guys. Uh, what can you do to help this person? You have to look at a statute and just see if there's like a private deal first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm really, you're right, but I'm really raising it now to, I'm going to keep going back to that scenario uh, because over the next um, couple of months, I'm going to, my goal is to get you to the point where for real, if, if that person came to you, you would know exactly what to do and what to say. Okay, we're gonna, and we're gonna run through some of the scenarios. 
but you know, your job as an admin lawyer is to say, you know, okay, calm down. Here's a tissue. Let's have a look at this. Who are these people, and why did they decide against you? And what can we do about it? Maybe go to court. There's different things we might be able to do. Um, but you guys are going to be um, in a position where you're going to be able to analyze the situation and give good advice on how to proceed. Okay, another re sort of real life example. After a hearing, the Ontario Human Rights Tribunal finds that a company contravened the Human Rights Code and orders damages. The company thinks the tribunal did not conduct a fair hearing and it, it did, the company did not have an opportunity to present its case. What can the company do? Okay, so again, um, this is just getting you used to some of the ideas, so it's not like you need to you know, memorize a slide or know or understand everything on the slide. <clears throat> but by way of introduction, here's a few things that um, you guys, as admin lawyers, would think about. If the jockey came to you upset, didn't know what to do, and you know, we like to get practical here and say, well, here's one thing you could do. You could ask the decision maker to change the decision. People are always like, what? You can't do that. Well, yes, you can. Not super likely to be successful. Um, you might be able to appeal to another administrative tribunal if it's possible. Uh, an example we have here is the Workplace Safety and Insurance Board, WSIB. You can appeal decisions of WSIB to a thing called the Workplace Safety and Insurance Appeals Tribunal. I have a question. So, <clears throat> when we say ask the decision maker to change the decision, is it yeah. this specific person who issued the decision? Because I think in the fact that there was a, like a, an option of going to the uh, supervisor of the person. So, would this yeah. decision maker include just this individual or the the agency in general? Yeah, technically, you're supposed to go to the the individual, but if you wrote to the agency, it could have the same impact. But technically, you should go to that very individual or individuals and ask them to this, to change the decision. Uh, okay, so appeal to another administrative tribunal. So this is weird. How would you know if that if that's an option? The statute. The statute. Yes. Um, Always the statute. Sometimes, yeah. Is that on there? No, it's not on there. Yes, you're right. Um, that's a good point. Sometimes within the agency itself, there's an appeal or a reconsideration. So you could find that out in the statute. How else could you find find out that something like that? What to do? For sure, the statute's the first place you look. What's another place you would look? Their website of that. Their website, yes. And what do some uh, DMs tribunals have on their website? Yeah. They might have a thing that's often called a code of procedure, a set of rules. Lots of tribunals, most tribunals have rules or guidelines or a code of procedure or something like that that will tell you and may tell you. Oh, here's what you can do if you're not happy with the decision. You can appeal, you can ask for reconsideration, something like that. No. No, that's a good question. Chances are they're not whoever whoever made the decision and gives you a written decision, it's not going to tell you in there what you can do. Maybe. Maybe they will. Normally you you won't see that. In Greece, it's part of the uh, fairness procedure. They have to put it in. Yeah, that's a good idea. They should do it here. And they don't. Um, okay. What else can you do? You could appeal to a, to a court if it's permitted. How would you know if there's an appeal to a court? Statute. Statute, yes. There's no magic inherent right to appeal. It's in the statute. 
So you statute, if you just say statute randomly all night long, you're going to be right about 80% of the time. Um, yeah. Appeals are only in the statute. People uh, get confused about that. Sometimes think you know, there's some inherent right to appeal. No, an appeal is always in the statute. If it's not in the statute, there's no appeal. And that's why we separate it out. We go to the next bullet point, which is seek judicial review, which we're going to learn is an inherent right. Well, although it's actually set out in statute now in Canada and federally, you can bring a judicial review. Um, what you guys should get comfortable with is the idea that you're always entitled to bring a judicial review, no matter what, in our world. Doesn't mean the court's going to be happy to hear from you, um, but you're entitled to bring a JR, what we call a JR, judicial review. More about that later. Um, or, you know, we do talk about seeking other kinds of remedies, potentially, but these are going to be unusual private law remedies. Um, go to the ombudsman to complain, see if they can help you. Lobby elected officials, maybe, to change something, change the law, something like that. Or go to the court of public opinion, the media. It's amazing how, um, anybody read the star? They were big on this. Yeah. You know, people will say, oh, you know, I got screwed over by this public official or whatever, and then they make a big deal in the media. And, you know, these people read, they, they read the papers, and they might, because of public pressure, might change their mind about something. Might even change a decision. Okay, so that, again, this is just getting used to the idea of challenging a public, um, uh, challenging a DM the different options that you have as a practical matter. We're going to spend almost all of our time doing on judicial review. Um, okay, J judicial review versus an appeal, we, we do have to think about how they're different or the same. Uh, generally speaking, in a classic appeal, the new decision maker will just substitute their own decision for that of the original decision maker. So on appeal, the, the new appeal DM will just say, okay, well, I think, um, you know, you should win and you should lose. But we think about judicial review in a different way, um, in, a, in a few different ways. Um, first of all, judicial review is discretionary, discretionary remedy, so a court doesn't have to even hear your case. On judicial review, the court always has discretion as to whether to even hear your case or to, if they hear it, uh, whether or not to give you a remedy, which is different from an appeal. Uh, another really, really important point, again, like almost all of this stuff, I'm going to be repeating later, right? So this is very introductory. Another important point, though, about judicial review, the classic remedy is to return the decision to the original decision maker. Now that's something that freaks a lot of people out. It's hard to get your head around. Imagine you're the jockey. You just got a horrible decision, you know, banning you from horse racing for life. They go to you, you say, all right, we're going to divisional court, we're gonna JR this, and you win, the jockey wins, but here's the win. Uh, the matter is remitted back to the Ontario Racing Commission for a new hearing. What's your client going to say? <laughs> You've got to be kidding. Is this some kind of joke? Like, I want my license back. So you're going to have to say, well, before the hearing, you know, you got to keep in mind that what might happen here is you're going to go back before these people that hate you. <laughs> I'm using very strong language there. But, um, so, you know, you client and you have to make your client aware of the reality that that is the classic remedy and if you say well no no divisional court I, I, my client wants his license back they're going to say that's not what we do you know we're not the Ontario Racing Commission we're sending it back 
because they're the ones who, should, who need to do it and do it right. The majority of cases they send it back. No, I know the statistics for the decision maker. The decision maker gets the CDs back. Yeah. Oh. How often do they actually change the decision maker? I don't know if there's any way of really knowing that. <laughs> it's a good question, but yeah, it's a really good question. But for us, just know that the decision maker can say, okay, we'll have a new hearing. You lose. They can. What can you do then? Repeat the process. Yes, JR again. You can JR again. If you lose it. Yeah, until you win. <laughs> What's the downside of that? What's the downside of that? How much do you guys think a typical JR costs? Where you go all the way to here? That's very low. Well, keep going. Really? Hundreds a bit high. <laughs> if that's it's 50, 60, 70, up to 100. Yeah. And that covers what? Just the lawyers? Lawyers' fees, yes. <laughs> yes. They're complicated. That, you know, they're not all that complicated, but most, most of them are, are complicated. They raise a lot of issues, and it's very expensive. So again, I want you to think about, it's very easy to say, oh, just bring a JR. Well, okay, yeah, but it's gonna cost a lot of money. Okay. Just a pra you know, practical consideration, which is why when we go back here, we say, oh, these other things are starting to look pretty good. Because I don't really want to spend $60,000. I guess it really depends on the like, uh, yeah. for uh, What's at stake? Well, a lifetime ban for a jockey, like that's just livelihood for the next 20, 30 years. Yeah, or exactly. So, so in that scenario, boy, there's a lot at stake. Yeah. Um, but you, what's the reality? Is the jockey, you know, 30 or 55? Yeah. Right, so you, you look at the real life, you know, okay, you'll get your license back, but you've only got a couple more years left in your career or whatever, right? or how long they, um, you know, they, they race for. Okay, so, yeah, so we need, to, again, really important point, we need to understand that the classic judicial review remedy is, well, we use great language here. What, so, I don't know if you read it. What's, what's the word they use when the court says um, this was a bad decision? It starts with Q. Oh, they quash it. Quash. So the classic remedy is quash. Great word. When would you ever use that word in a lot of context? Never. You, they, they quash the decision and they remit it back, or they send it back to the original decision maker. I think they should really call it squash. I think that would be more <laughs> better word. So they quash it and they remit it back. That is a classic remedy. Um, you can try to persuade the court to do something different. Here, what would you say? If you were the jockey's lawyer, what would you ask the court to do? Yeah, you'd say, I know, I know that, you know, I took it mid I know the classic remedy is quash and remit back, but don't do that here, please. <laughs> Just give him his license back. Or, or really the way it would work is you, Court, can you order the Ontario Racing Commission to re, um, reinstate the license? That's how it would work. And you may, you may be successful, and you would save your client a lot of grief and a lot of time and a lot of money. Uh, but they're going to look at that and say, well, why should we do that? It's not a classic remedy. Why should we do that? So you, you're going to have an uphill battle. Yeah, so that's the third point. Only in certain circumstances will a reviewing court substitute its own decision. So they're not gonna wanna say, well, I think this uh, the jockey uh, never should have lost his license. They're not gonna say that. That's what, they're gonna say, that's not our job. 
Our job is to decide whether the DM made an error or not. And if they did, we send it back. End of the story, because it's not our problem. But, but, but that's, uh, that Back or same or no, no, standard of review is separate. We're, I'm going to explain yeah. how that applies. That's more like how closely are they going to look at that decision and, and want to know whether it's a good decision. That's different from remedy. Okay, so remedy is totally separate. That's after you win or lose, then what's the remedy? So we'll keep those very distinct. Hey, how's everybody doing? Good. Hang in there? Good. Okay. Um, you know what? I'm going to skip this slide. Because I think it just complicates things unnecessarily. Okay, so I'm going to go to the next slide. Uh, which is really important because this is kind of everything on one slide that we're going to cover in a way. Because there's really only two grounds for judicial review. Okay, remember I talked about um, there's procedural fairness and substantive review. Those two big, big concepts that we're going to spend many, many hours on. Well, that's right here. There's only two grounds for judicial review. One is the decision was not procedurally fair. So procedural fairness. And that breaks down, down into these two subcategories, the right to be heard and the right to have a decision that's free from bias. The other ground, major ground for judicial review is there's a, there is a substantive error with the decision or in the decision? So a whole lot of what we're going to talk about is distinguishing between those two areas and making sure we don't mix them up because one of the biggest mistakes that administrative law students make is they get confused between the two. I understand. It's, it's easy to get confused, but my job is to get you guys to be very clear about the distinction, because in a way, they're like two different worlds. Procedural fairness and substantive review. And what's important to think about is that when we're talking about procedural fairness, we have a whole kind of, um, a whole, whole bag of tricks whole set of tools, we'll call it a toolbox, whatever, language, all of that is different. We've got one box of tools here and one box of tools here. So we don't use the same language. We talk in a totally different way about procedural fairness and substantive review. Standard of review. Okay? So we're going to, um, I'm going to spend a lot of time emphasizing the difference and making sure that you know you know which area we're talking about and what words to use because you can't cross over if you cross over you'll get in big trouble um, so we'll make sure that that doesn't happen okay so in a way summing up procedural fairness right to be heard decision free from bias so when the jockey comes in, you're going to say, "All right, let's look at this. Uh, let's look at this decision. Tell me about what happened at the hearing. Let's see if we can attack this decision on procedural fairness grounds." All right? That's going to be your first thing you're going to look at. Can we attack this decision on procedural fairness grounds? We're going to see a whole lot of examples of where decision makers where DMs blow it on procedure. They make a mistake. They do something that's unfair. Uh, and you're going to get all the tools to analyze that, kind of all these checklists to make sure, or, or to allow you to spot a problem. Aha, uh -huh, I think that's a problem. 
And if you can convince the court on judicial review that the DM made a procedural error, was procedurally unfair, you're gold. Because almost always the court's going to say, okay, this decision cannot stand. If, if there is a procedural error, the whole thing has to fall down. It's fatal. I don't care how great this decision is and how beautifully worded it is, and what a brilliant decision the decision maker wrote, doesn't matter. If it's procedurally, procedurally unfair, if the hearing was procedurally unfair, the whole thing falls. So of course, when you're helping, uh, advising your jockey friend, you're gonna wanna spend a lot of time on that. And say, let's see if we can find a procedural error. Because if we can, we're good. Maybe they made more than one procedural error. <coughs> one, two, or three. You can try all three. So that's one angle of attack. You do that. You go through that. Then you set her aside and you say, okay, I'm bringing out my other toolkit, and we're going to decide whether there's a substantive error with the decision. Where do we look to for that? Substantive error. What are we looking at? To see what their powers are, like the unthinking the ultra-mirrors part of this? Well, what do we, maybe, but... To see, okay, when we go back to procedural fairness, what are we looking at? What are we looking at? Procedure. Procedure. What happened in the hearing? Yeah, what happened in the hearing, and was there a mistake? Did they fail to do something, or they did something wrong, or whatever? When we're in substantive review, looking for a substantive error, where are we looking? Decision itself. The reasons. We often refer to that as the reasons. And remember I said there's going to be a, you know, something like this, you know, 10-page written decision. Well, that's where you look for substantive error. And you're going to read it carefully line by line, and you're going to look for mistakes, weird things that are said, um, errors. Yeah, you might look at the statute. Anyway, yeah. The only point being, you're gonna look at the reasons for decision and see if there's something in there that doesn't make sense um, or some kind of mistake, right? illegal. Or if it's poorly written, we can actually JR on the grounds that it's poorly written. What if, the, just, what if our jockey friend lost their license, and the whole decision was one paragraph on one page. Oh. What would you say? Absence of reasons. Yeah, so that's that's going to be one possible ground then. Really? We had this whole day hearing, and they wrote one paragraph saying you lose, basically? That can't be good enough. So that could be a substantive error with the decision. The reasons are not good enough. They have mistakes, they're too short, they don't make sense. I think we've probably all read reasons that you, or even court decisions where you read it and you go, I, I have no idea what they're talking about. Huh? I can't even follow this. It's so complicated and, and confusing and it doesn't make sense. So that's what we, we're looking at the reasons in the second part. This would also be where you would uh, pick apart if they either Based the decision on something that shouldn't have been considered, like I don't know, we don't yeah. want blue eyes, blonde, so we make four dogs, or put too much weight on something. Yeah, okay. and we're going to talk about that. Oh, okay. That would be an error, error of discretion. Okay. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. It could also be, and often what we look at is uh, an interpretation. They say, well, I think, you know, this term means this, like a leap, interpreting the statute. And you read it, your lawyer, you read it and say, that's weird. I don't think that. that doesn't sound right to me. That's a weird interpretation. And the whole case turned on it. We need to attack that. That's an error. That's a legal error. That's a substantive error. So we're going to go to court over that. And a legal error is a good one because what did, what did judges think? They think they know the law, right? They can read a statute better than anyone. So they're not going to, they don't want to defer to some DM. They're going to say, we know, we know how to read a statute, we know what's right. Anyway, we're going to get into that.
So again, this is intro introduction. But you can see how the two worlds are separate. When you do a judicial review, is it possible that, like, I know they're separate, but is it possible yeah. that you bring both of the procedural yes. grounds in? Yes. I'm glad you raised that. Because as the jockey's lawyer, you're going to say exactly what you said. Let's look at both. Let's try to find both. Let's try to find, find a um, uh, procedural error, and let's try to find a substantive error. You may have no luck. You may look at it and say, oh boy, this was like a really fair hearing. I don't think I can help you there, but the reasons are really bad. Or the other way around. Like these reasons are really, you know, solid. This is a well-written decision. But they made a procedural error, so let's go after that. But what you often see is people try both. Because why not try both? Give yourself more of a chance to win. So attack it on two in two ways. Okay. Um, okay. So just a little going a little bit uh, deeper into what is procedural fairness. And I was saying before that procedural fairness is all about the process, not the outcome, right? When you're, when you're looking at procedural fairness, you say, I don't care about the outcome, it doesn't matter. How did, the per how did this DM get there? What were the steps? That's what matters. It's the process. Uh, and then we have this principle, this kind of touchstone that if an administrative DM is making a decision that affects the rights, privileges, or interests of a person, they are owed procedural fairness. And the content of procedural fairness is not the same in every case, but will include the right to be heard and the right to the decision free from bias. Okay, let's go to that principle above in the, the third bullet. If, an, if a DM is making a decision that affects rights, privileges, or interests of a person, they are on procedural fairness. So what is that telling you? Sorry? You would think, you would think, but what is that implying? There's an if there. Yes. If. Sorry, I'm not doing a good job. <laughs> if it doesn't affect the interests of the person, then... does that mean that everyone is owed a duty of fairness in every case? Oh, actually, the answer to that question is no. No, we got there. No, not every person is entitled to procedural fairness. Really important to know. I know people are giving me the. The eye on this one. Really? It's true. You guys have to be, you know, as, as you know, lawyers, as legal practitioners, you got to be comfortable with this idea that, hey, not everyone's entitled, entitled to procedural fairness. If we lived in a perfect world, maybe, but not in administrative law. So believe it or not, you're you may encounter situations where the person is not entitled to procedural fairness. Well, they're never entitled to. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> How do you know? Well, we're going to give you we're going to give you a template. There's case law. We're going to help you um, sort that out as to whether. A person is owed procedural fairness. Can you give an example as to when they wouldn't be owed that? Um, okay. And it may be on another slide, but. Okay, let me go back. Okay. So, stepping back for a minute. There's different kinds of DMs, right? DMs, we've been talking about DMs that affect, you know, jockey who lost their license, or a DM who made a decision about a company that said, um, oh, you broke the human rights um, code, and therefore you're being fined. 
those are the easy cases, right? Of course, procedural fairness is going to be owed in those cases. But in the administrative law world, the big world, there are DMs who do stuff like, uh, oh, we're going to make a, dis uh, a policy decision to raise phone rates or something like that. It affects like, everyone in Canada. CRTC, right? They deal with uh, you know, telecoms and, and uh, phone rates and things like that. What if the CRTC says, yes, we're going to allow the, uh, the telecom to raise their rates by 10% next year? And you go see a lawyer and tell the lawyer, I'm waiting to JR that, I never got procedural fairness. Does that strike you as a situation where you could you could win the day? What's the lawyer going to tell you? You have no standing. No, but you'd say I'm I'm affected. I'm going to have to pay more money for my cell phone. I'm affected, right? The decision was to the population. Yeah, it's the whole population of Canada. It was not aimed to this Exactly. So there's an example of where. You know, you as a lawyer, or somebody came to you and said, "I want you to fight this case." You're going to say, "No, you're you're actually not entitled to procedural fairness because this affected the whole country. It's a broad it's a broad policy decision, okay? Not an individual, um, you know, aimed at an individual. It could be a company mm -hmm. or an individual. Um, it's a policy type decision that's broad." And therefore, the courts say, no, that's, there's nobody's rights, privileges, rights, privileges, and interests affected in the sense that we need, right? Even though, yeah, everyone's getting, everyone's going to get hit in the wallet, yeah. But it's a broad um, policy type decision. So, no, no procedural fairness. Okay, I don't know how long it time it was. You know, we're getting into a little bit of a philosophy of why, why is procedural fairness important? And we talk about, you know, better decision making, right? If you have, if you give people an opportunity to make their case, uh, we say that, well, that's by definition going to lead to better and more consistent decision making, right? As opposed to a decision maker who says, I don't need to hear from you, I know the answer. I'm not gonna give you a chance to speak. You want DMs to encourage parties to raise raise issues, make submissions, so that you can have better decision making. Um, but moving to sources of procedural fairness. Okay, so. Procedural fairness comes from different places. We're going to spend a lot of time on the common law, that last bullet, uh, because that's what almost all the procedural fairness cases come down to. They come down to whether there's a right to procedural fairness in common law and you know what that right means and whether there's been a procedural error by the DA. But we have to understand, too, that we don't start there. We kind of finish there. We start by looking at the statute. Again, always the right answer, statute. We look at the statute because sometimes the statute gives procedural fairness. Can you think of an example? Where, would it, where and how might a statute give procedural fairness? Kind of a hard question. Okay, I'll, I'll give you an example. So a statute might say, and it does say to, to me, to my office, um, that we, you know, in an appeal, we have to hear from the parties. We have to give people an opportunity to make submissions. It's right there in the statute, very easy, there's no debate. 
So people can say, aha, there's procedural fairness right there in the statute, and you better give that to me. And if you don't, you've made a procedural error. So that's really easy. And there's all kinds of other um, statutory uh, procedural fairness benefits uh, that people can um, rely on and take advantage of. There, there's also this thing called procedural codes. We'll get into that later. Um, but also rules, policies, and guidelines. Remember, we talked about the website of the DM. They might have a, a set of rules or policies or guidelines that indicate they're going to give some procedural benefits. So you can point to that and say, oh, you know, your rules say that um, I'm entitled to an oral hearing, for example. So you better give me an oral hearing. You know, we don't talk about those a lot because they're usually so obvious. There's no debate. Uh, and again, as I said, most cases are going to come down to the common law where you say, okay, I've read the statute, I've read the, the code of procedure, there's nothing there that, you know, answers my, my problem or my question. Therefore, I've got to go to common law. And that's what we spend a lot of time on, is at common law, as I said before, that principle, if an administrative DM is making a decision that affects the rights, privileges, or interests of a person, they are owed procedural fairness. That's common law. And then we say, well, what's the content of procedural fairness? That's common law. The right to be heard, the right to a decision free from bias, which we're going to spend a lot of time on what those two mean. I think it's a good time for a break. So let's take um, 15 minutes so if we can try to get back at 20 to 8. Anyway, we're going to we touched on procedural fairness a little bit. Uh, we'll now touch on substantive review, right? The other big component of administrative law. So we say um, that the court is always going to ask on substantive review, what is the degree of intensity with which this decision should be reviewed? In other words, what is the standard of review? And that's where you know, that, that magic phrase, standard of review, comes in. And it's about, again, what is the degree of intensity that the court is going to look at that set of reasons? How closely is it going to scrutinize that set of reasons? Um, and there's only, you know, two standards, right? The correctness and reasonableness. Uh, yeah, I'll skip that, the rest of that. So here are the two standards. Correctness and reasonableness. So what does correctness mean? Correctness means the decision maker must get it right. So in a correctness situation, the court, the judges are going to say, we know best, and we know whether these reasons and this outcome are okay or not okay. Right and wrong. We know the difference between right and wrong because we're judges and we're smart and we're smarter than this DM. So we know the answer. And that DM better get it right. And if they don't get it right, we're gonna quash it. Now you're gonna learn that correctness is pretty, it's relatively rare. Most cases in the real world are not um, reviewed on a standard of correctness, but they're reviewed on a standard of reasonableness. What is reasonableness? Well, reasonableness allows for the possibility that there is more than one correct outcome or, or acceptable outcome. Even if the court would have chosen another outcome, it defers to the decision maker. So there's another magic word in there, defers. So the correctness, uh, it's focused more on the rule of law? Yes. Yes. 
and I'll, we'll explain that more later. But you're right. Um, but we'll, we'll park that for now. So, think of it this way. Who has a dishwasher? <laughs> Not everybody, only say, right? So if you invite me over to your place for dinner, you cook me a nice dinner, and I say, that was a delicious dinner, thanks for inviting me. You sit down, I'm gonna load the dishwasher for you. I'll take all the plates and the cutlery, and I'm gonna load the dishwasher. And you look at me and go, okay. And I start loading it. Some of you, I'm sure, are gonna say, no, 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 you're not doing it right. <laughs> the dishes always have to face to the right. And the cutlery always goes in, you know, fork side up, not fork side down. All right? Some of you don't care, but some of you will care. So the reason I, I use this example, other people use this example, is there, there's more, most of you or a lot of you are going to say, well, it doesn't really matter. There's more than one way to load a dishwasher, right? As, as long as the dishes are in there and they get clean, and you, after you, you start the dishwasher, they come out clean, then what's the difference? You could load it. There's five different ways to load a dishwasher. It doesn't matter. They're all okay. They're all reasonable. Is that making any sense? Yep. Mm -hmm. Or some of you are going to say, no, 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 there's only one way to load my dishwasher, and you better get it right. But again, most people would say, eh, it doesn't really matter. So there are different ways, and to put it in our, in our context, there are different ways to decide a case that are all reasonable. Okay, so that's what reasonableness, reasonableness is. It's kind of an area where the court says, you know what, there's going to be different ways or different outcomes that are all acceptable. And if the DM chose one way of deciding the case that's reasonable, we're going to let it go, even if we don't think it's right. Let's go back to the horse job. The court might say, hmm, it seems a bit harsh that they took his license away. And we would not, we wouldn't have done that. But we're going to defer to the decision maker and say, fine, you decided to revoke the license, and that's a reasonable decision. That's a reasonable outcome, so we're going to let it go. Okay, and disciplined judges will do that on judicial review. They'll say, again, we might not have decided the case this way, but the way it was decided by the DM is reasonable. We're going to let it go. Okay. Again, I'm introducing the idea. We're going to spend a lot more time on this. So the reasonableness standard is the true test of the theory. Can a court leave a decision below? Be deferential to the decision maker below. So reasonableness and deference. Again, we remember we talked about you know, these magic words that we use. Reasonableness and deference kind of go hand in hand. They're kind of two ways of describing the same thing. Can we leave, can the court leave the decision alone and defer, no matter what it might think? So judges have a hard time with this, right? Because most judges, there are comfortable and they're used to the role of saying you're right and you're wrong. You win, you lose. That's the judge's comfort zone. When it comes to administrative law and judicial review, a lot of judges are having a real hard time with this. But time and time again, the Supreme Court of Canada tells judges below, do it right. Deference and reasonableness are important and you better do it right and we don't want you running around telling DMs what you think is the right outcome. Don't do that because of reasonableness, because of deference. Oh, we already covered this. But I really want to say that word again. <laughs> Generally speaking, after a judicial review, 
And if the court finds an error, a procedural error or a substantive error, they're going to quash the decision, set it aside, and send it back to the original decision maker for a new consideration. Okay, so you guys got it. Yes, that's a good point. If it's correctness and they say it was incorrect, often what they'll do is they'll say, well, there's no point in having a new hearing because they just got it wrong. But sometimes they will send it back and say, do it right this time. Make the right decision. Uh, I'll skip that slide. This is just saying that, um, you know, courts and um, academics often talk about how difficult administrative law is and how the whole idea of deference and standard of review is so complicated and uh, very frustrating. So you can read that quote. I'll just read that. Second paragraph there, to fully appreciate just how uncertain and some might say silly, the test for determining whether a judge should interfere with an invention for a decision has become, one need only know that every application for JR requires each of the litigants to provide a reviewing judge with an analysis of the law of pragmatism first promulgated and pushed by Nathan. That exercise alone is responsible for the serious depletion of force. It's kind of fun. But basically saying how Everyone in the system finds it tough, finds it really difficult. This whole standard of review and deference stuff is really, really difficult. Uh, but we're going to make it as easy as we can. Okay, one other thing I want to mention. Remember I talked about there's really the two periods, right? Um, procedural fairness and substantive review. I'm going to give you a one-page um, template for each of those, a one pager and a one pager that you will be able to pull out and use and apply to, if you have a procedural fairness problem, you can use that one. And if you have a substantive review problem, you can use that one. So you'll always have that as kind of your safety net, uh, which will help you um, avoid, you know, crossing over and mixing things up, which again, as I was saying before, is a is a big problem um, for a lot of students and even lawyers and judges at times. Okay. There's quite a bit of repetition here. Um, so I'll kind of skip some slides here as appropriate. Uh, but we're gonna go back to some of the basics again. Skip what is the min law, how does government get involved? Common program areas we already kind of touched on. Again, reiterating all these areas of our society and our lives where administrative DMs get involved and make decisions. Just a little bit about what you'll see if you kind of want to get a good overview of the administrative law system in Ontario. Um, this is from the Ontario government website, might be a little dated. But you can see there's a website that actually lists all of the Ontario government ministries that are always changing. Um, and then there's another website that lists all of the, what in Ontario they call ADCs, agencies, boards, commissions, all the TMs in Ontario. They're all listed on this site. You can go on now and see an updated list. There'll be a couple of hundred or more. Uh, all of these DMs that we talk about, and there's a wide range of them, including the Ontario Moose Bear Allocation Advisory Committee, really important one. <laughs> I'm sure they do great work. <laughs> okay, and if we go over to the federal side, federal website again the same kind of thing where they list all of the ministries and agencies kind of all together in alphabetical order. Okay, so 
again, to get you comfortable with what does this whole world look like, uh, we'd like to talk about how a lot of administrative agencies um, do have a lot in common with each other. And what are the, some of the commonalities? Well, pretty much all of these DMs have some degree of independence from the government department um, that established it. And they're sort of outside the bureaucracy. They've got some degree of independence. Some might have a lot, some might have a little, but to some extent, they're their own DM and they do their own thing, right? They make their own decisions. And they don't have people you know, looking over their shoulder and telling them what to do, like politicians or ministers, that kind of thing. So they, they're kind of left alone to make their own decisions. And we use the word independence here. They've got some degree of independence to decide the way they want to decide every case. Uh, for the most part, uh, anybody who's affected by the dis a decision can participate. But we know that's not always the case, like with, say, the CRTC and the phone bills. We can't all individually go and, uh, you know, stand up at a hearing and say, I don't want you to raise my, my phone rates. They're probably not going to let us do that. But for the most part, people who are affected do get a chance to participate and, and say uh, what they think about, about the issue. Also, that last bullet point, for the most part, administrative agencies or DMs are specialized in some way. They have some degree of specialization, so they look at a relatively narrow area of the law under their statute. Unlike who? Judges. Court. Yeah, unlike courts, unlike judges, who tend to be more generalist. Okay, but so how are these, um, you know, hundreds of DMs different from each other? Well, they can differ in many ways. Uh, for example, what kinds of decisions do they make? They might make decisions that affect individuals, or maybe a whole industry. They regulate an industry. Uh, their structure can, can vary a lot. Some look a lot like a court look and act like a court. You walk into the room, what's it like at an IRB hearing? Some of you guys have been at an IRB hearing. What does it look like when you walk in? I think it's not really formal, but I, I mean the hearing is like serious, yeah. but the yeah. atmosphere is very relaxed. Pretty relaxed? Yeah, pretty relaxed. Right, but maybe a, a little bit court-like? Yeah, it's core like. Yeah. 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 So I think I, th I think that fits with my understanding of how they work and how a lot of DMs work. They look mm -hmm. maybe not exactly like a core, but a lot of them can look yeah. a fair bit like a core. Mm -hmm. Formal set. Um, and what's sort of at the opposite end of that? And some are less formal, less formal, less formal, and then some all the way at the other end of this of this spectrum do this thing called policy making, where it really doesn't look anything like a court, what they do. Nothing like a court. Like, again, I'm going to keep using that example of CRTC saying, well, we're going to, you know, think about whether um, cell phone rates should be raised or not. Case loads. Um, can somebody give me an example of a really high volume, high caseload DM? One more than ten and four. Perfect example. Good one. Immigration Refugee Board, yeah, I'd say it's pretty high. Maybe not the highest. Landlord and tenant board might be about the highest that you'll see in thousands of cases, right? Um, and they crank them out real fast. High volume. Some have like one case a year. Like the Bear Moose uh, <laughs> committee or whatever they were, commission. Yeah, they probably don't have a lot of hearings. I'd like to sit in one though. What do we have to do? Do bears and or moose attend the hearings? I don't know. <laughs> um, so yeah, differences in, in caseloads. Um, 
differences in outcomes, right? We're very used to the IRB or the landlord and tenant board, you know, there's an outcome, there's a winner, there's a loser. Um, but we have to get used to this idea that some are different, some are a bit weird, and they do things like they make recommendations. What is that? Sort of laugh about that, but that's that's reality. Some some DMs, that's all they do. They have some kind of hearing and then they make a recommendation. Which is not like what we're used to with a court. You don't see a judge saying, I recommend that the that the uh, the prisoner be the, go to jail for five years. <laughs> oh, thanks for the recommendation. We're just going to let him go. Okay. Here's a decision. But a lot of DMs, they just make a recommendation. We, Our office actually does recommendations in some cases. That's all we can do. Our statute doesn't let us do more. Um, okay, this next bullet is pretty important. Uh, differences in the impact on the person. <clears throat> so, boat license. I'm a recreational boater. And uh, does anyone have a boat license? How hard is it to get a boat license? Mine is pretty easy. It's pretty easy. You just do it online. Mm -hmm. You do it online. I don't think you have to take a course or anything. No. no. So let's say the government takes away my boat license, which I guess they could do. If I do something really bad. That's exactly what I was thinking about. That's Sorry. Well, it's a, tra it's a tragedy, but you know, there, um, you know, there may have been alcohol involved, that kind of thing, so who knows what's going to come out of that case. But um, let's say I'm a recreational boater and they take away my boat license. Do you feel sorry for me? Not really. Those are mean, by the way. No, you don't really because I'm. A, it's it's my recreation, right? And I contrast that to somebody saying, "I want to stay in Canada. I don't want to be deported from the country. You know, to my home country." Talk about you know a massive difference in the impact on the person or our jockey player, uh -huh. who's way over on that um, you know tough side of the spectrum because the jockey's never going to be able to race again. Or I can't be a lawyer, or I can't be a doctor, I can't um, you know, pursue my livelihood. Big deal. Compared to boat license or fishing license or something like that. Um, I mean, it's both administrative law and administrative uh, decisions are made, but they have very different um, impacts. <clears throat> uh, there's also a spectrum of um, who the members are and whether they're experts or not. Uh, at the let's say the College of Physicians and Surgeons, the people who make these decisions about doctors and whether they've engaged in medical malpractice. Do you think they have expertise? They better. <laughs> That's for sure. I, if you ask me to decide a case like that, I, I would have no idea what I was doing, right? I don't know, I'm not a doctor. I don't know anything about that. Uh, you know, practice of medicine or surgery or something like that. I have no expertise. But, so we want people who really know their stuff to be on, um, to be a DM like that. But there are DMs out there who don't have much expertise. They're just, you've heard the term lay people, they're just ordinary people. And maybe that's okay if they're deciding, uh, you know, whether I get a boat license. We're not too worried about that. They don't have to be too specialized. So we've got, we've got some differences there. <clears throat> um, the range of administrative tools. Oh, question, sorry. Yeah. Um, the impact for the persons which are impact to the contents of the procedure permits. Um, sorry. Like if it impacts the person more, are they going to have more procedure permits? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's coming. You're absolutely right. Yeah. So. You raised the point, I'll just uh, say that. Yeah, the more, so if we go back to the impact of the person, boat license versus stay in Canada, as you might expect, and as Priscilla is pointing out, likely there's gonna be more procedural fairness expected on the stay in Canada decision than on the boat license decision. We're gonna learn how that 
how that works uh, later on. But you're absolutely right. Okay, range of administered tools. So adjudication is one tool that DX have. Another one of these words we have to get comfortable with. What does it mean? Where does it fit? Sometimes DMs are called adjudicators. And um, what do courts do? It's pretty much with what courts do, right? That first bullet, adjudication, that's what court, that's what judges do. They adjudicate. It's pretty much all they do. Courts are, you know, one trick pony. They can do one thing and they can do it really well, but that's it. I'm really down on courts. <laughs> uh, but look at all these other things that courts don't, can't or don't do. These other kinds of roles that, or tools that it, uh, DMs have. Education, advice and recommendations, testing, investigations, inspections, uh, hearing complaints, issuing policies, rules, or guidelines, all these different things that DMs um, have the ability to do that courts can't do it, don't do it, not interested in it. So you can see how big our, you know, our world is. It's really big and uh, such a variety of things. Okay, we kind of touched on this already. Just note that, you know, the focus here is going to be this, judicial oversight and DX, right? Judicial review. So we're going to spend most of our time talking about it. Um, on this one, I'll just point out, because we kind of covered it, this idea that the courts have inherent judicial review uh, jurisdiction. So both in Ontario, because we care about Ontario, federal, Ontario Divisional Court, Federal Court, they have inherent jurisdiction to hear a judicial review of any DM's decision, right? So you, in other words, we know and we're comfortable with the idea that we can always go to judicial review if we get a decision from a DM that we don't like. Okay, it's a bit of history of judicial review. I'm going to skip this one. <clears throat> okay. So Godzilla and King Kong, back to those guys. And their eternal struggle, battle. Uh, so this is from Dunsmuir, probably the most important case still to this day in administrative law, Dunsmuir from 2008. And this, this is what Dunsmuir, the court of Dunsmuir, Supreme Court of Canada, in 2008 had to say about rule of law, the rule of law principle and administrative law. By virtue of the rule of law principle, all exercises of public authority must find their source in law. All decision-making powers have legal limits derived from the enabling statute itself, the common law or the civil law or the constitution. Judicial review is the means by which the courts supervise those who exercise statutory powers to ensure that they do not overstep their legal authority. Okay, so that principle of rule of law, you know, what, what upholds us and protects us in Canada uh, and enforces the rule of law, the courts. That's who does that. That way of judicial review. So then we we uh, can be comforted by the fact that these DMs, these statutory DMs, can't run around and go crazy and do stuff that they're not allowed to do in their statute and be procedurally unfair or issue crazy decisions. That's procedural fairness and substantive review. Right? So that's rule of law. We have the courts to go to to enforce the rule of law to make sure DMs don't you know, trample all over us and, uh, you know, harm us and take away our rights. Rule of law. <clears throat> okay, that one's pretty, 
we're pretty comfortable with that, that idea. It's pretty uh, intuitive. More on the rule of law. Administered powers are exercised by DMs according to a statutory regime uh, that is, is itself confined. A decision maker may not exercise authority not specifically assigned to him or her by acting in the absence of legal authority. The DM transgresses the principle of the rule of law. The other side of the equation is a little harder to understand, but we need to we need to think about it. And that is parliamentary supremacy. What does that mean? What does parliamentary supremacy or legislative supremacy mean? This quote is probably not going to help you very much, but I'll read it anyway. In essence, the rule of law is maintained because the courts have the last word on jurisdiction, and legislative supremacy is assured because determining the applicable standard is accomplished by establishing legislative intent. That quote doesn't really help. <laughs> let, me, let me back up and look at it another way, which is, I think we're going to touch on it in later slides. So this whole idea that the legislature or parliament says, if you go back to the beginning of time, courts decided every dispute, right? 200 years ago, 130 years ago. Uh, now, or over time, over the many decades, legislatures decided, you know what, this doesn't really make sense anymore. We've got to, set, we've got to create these, these DMs to decide immigration issues, human rights issues, landlord and tenant issues, all this stuff. And we're going, to, we're going to give them, we're going to create statutes, we're going to create them, and we're going to give them statutes, and we're going to send them off to do justice in their little worlds. So when courts come along and just interfere with that, that undermines parliamentary supremacy. Right? Because the legislatures wanted their little DMs to do, just do their job and be left alone to do their job. Not have everything go to court. So you can see kind of the other side of the equation, which suggests that courts should keep their hands off and let DMs do their thing. Because the more courts interfere and interfere and interfere, the more the leg legislature just you know gets frustrated and says, you're not letting them do their job. If you keep interfering with them, you're undermining our intent. And our intent is to have the DMs be independent, to be left alone, and let them do their job unless they do something really bad. Go off the rails in some way. Right? So we always have to look at the other side of the equation, which is legislatures want DMs to operate smoothly, efficiently, and not get attacked all the time by people running off to court. Okay, so that's the flip side of the coin. Rule of law, yeah, but only to a point where our courts have to, have to be respectful and leave them alone. Let them do their job unless they do something really bad. Okay, does that make any sense? A little bit? Okay. We're gonna revisit it. I went really fast. So th this is our sort of eternal kind of um, tension in administrative law, uh, both on the procedural fairness side and on, on the substantive review side. Okay, rule of law versus parliamentary supremacy. So we're always debating about when and where should the court interfere with the DM's procedure or with the DM's um, substantive uh, decision. 
So that's where King Kong and Godzilla, rule of law, parliamentary supremacy come into play. Pretty much in every case you can think of, the admin law is really a reflection of that tension between those two camps. And, and over many years, there have been um, you know, developments this way and that way, kind of where rule of law becomes more important, and then that might proceed, and then parliamentary supremacy becomes more important. So, yeah, this is the tension that we see in the middle. myself by getting through the slides quicker than I thought I would. Uh, but I didn't want tonight to be too heavy for you guys. Uh, so I will just ask whether you have any questions. How do we apply that the conflict to the procedural terms? I can understand to the submissive side of the deference and everything, but to procedural fairness, it doesn't make sense. Okay, again, on procedural fairness, one could say, okay, on the rule of law side, why is procedural fairness important? Instead of having fairness, you're trying to clash with the whole idea of the rule of law in the first place. Yeah, exactly. And we often talk about, um, you know, a DM being unfair is kind of undermining the rule of law. It's a, a DM who fails to give a party an opportunity to make their case or uh, fails to be transparent and give relevant inf information, these kinds of things, we say, well, that undermines the rule of law. What's the flip side of that, though? How would parliamentary supremacy come into play? It's the same kind of thinking. Back and forth. But on the, yeah, but uh, that's true. But also, yeah, on the procedural fairness side, what would the legis legislature say? What, do, what would the legislature say if the courts continually say, oh, that's unfair, you know, we're saying it back. Unfair, unfair, unfair. Well, then I think uh, legislatures would be uh, telling that it's not for the courts to be making those decisions. That uh, legislature are elected officials and they uh, you know pass acts and yeah. the role of the court is to apply the law not to make law really perhaps yeah yeah you're getting there okay I would imagine that uh, the legislature should say that the DMs are specialized in their own procedures Whereas the courts have just an overall basic understanding of all the procedures, right. which they shouldn't uh, poke their nose yeah, too much. Yeah, exactly. Let the legislature would say, let our DMs make their own procedural decisions. Courts stay out of it. You're absolutely right. Use the use a really good word there that they're they have expertise in their own area and they have expertise in procedures. So. The law society knows how to make its own procedures to be fair in dealing with, you know, lawyers' discipline. What do courts know? Courts don't really get that. Judges don't really get that. They should stay out of it. And they shouldn't bring their own court standards to a DM who has their specialized area. They should stay out of it. Right? Back off. Is it, you know, defer. Stay out of it. Unless something really bad happens, fine. But otherwise, stay out of it. But maybe uh, as a check and balance, there's also the possibility that if you see a whole lot of the same kind of problem coming from landlord tenant, that okay, maybe there's something in the infrastructure that needs to be revised or changed. Yeah, that needs to be fixed. And yeah, put yeah. It back to the yeah, yeah. But again, it, it really does go back to this idea that the legislatures create these DMs like they're little children, they're little babies, and they give them all these powers and they say, go, go do it, go make decisions. You know, you're in charge, you manage it, you figure out how to do this. Make up, make your own procedures, 
make your own decisions. You, when the legislatures do that, they don't want the court sitting there going, you know, swatting these cases down all the time and just getting in the way. Legislatures want their DMs to be free from, I'll use the word harassment, that's almost like judicial harassment. You know, I make, uh, make a joke, but it, it, it can be seen that way as harassment or interference. Interference with their independence. Leave them alone. The message the legislatures would want to send is leave them alone. Don't keep interfering with what they're doing because we, the legislature, we speak for the people, we make a law that says you guys go do it. Not you guys go do it and, and, and check with the courts to see if your decisions are okay. That's ridiculous. Why do that? It's like more hair that uh, procedures would be imposed by common law, like the new procedures would be imposed by the common law, like another thing that doesn't happen. Because I think the yeah. judges did it to new prisons that didn't used to be a usual before, but that's something that doesn't happen normally. Okay, you lost me. Like the Baker, Baker, yeah. Like, I don't remember very much because I did it for nations, but like, uh, I think that it was just the duty to give reasons. The duty to give yeah. reasons. Yeah, well, it's but not new, but it came up in that case, yeah. But like, it's more like fair that the common law is what you put to the procedural requirements. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and uh, the, I'm glad you raised it because, again, I said it before, a lot of what we talk about is what does the common law say about what's procedurally fair or not. And that's where the courts come in and they apply the common law. And we're gonna see lots of cases that talk about, um, well, how much fairness is anybody even entitled to? Well, really two things. A common law is a person even entitled to procedural fairness, right? And my boat license case, let's go back to that. If I JR that, what do you think the court's going to say about my ability to have um, procedural fairness? That's fine. Why not? It affects me. <laughs> they probably, okay. You need to know the reasons why they took away your license. Maybe. Probably what they would do in that case is they say to me, sure, we'll, we'll agree, you have, you're entitled to procedural fairness, but then the next question is how much? And they're going to say, low. Very low, very low. This much procedural fairness, almost nothing, because it's a boat license. There's not much at stake. So we're gonna expect very little. So I'm probably not gonna succeed in saying, oh, I should have had a hearing, and I should have had disclosure, and why don't I have a detailed reasons as to why I lost my boat license? The court's gonna say, no, they don't have to do any of that. Yeah, yeah. If you take a license away from a company that's a shipping company or something, that's a whole different thing. There's way more at stake. So that's going to be, there's going to be more fairness required. So that's what we're going to learn starting next class is, and I'm going to give you a template for that, how much fairness, even if you are entitled to fairness, how much are you entitled to in any given case? Okay, and we're going to see a bunch of cases that well, really, Baker. Baker gives us the guide as to how you, to determine how much fairness you're entitled to. Low, medium, or high. That's what it boils down to. Low, medium, or high. Ms. Baker was entitled to medium. Yes, only wow. medium, wow. not high. Anybody know why? She was going to be um, <clears throat> deported from Canada. Why would they say medium? Why not high? Didn't she have, as I remember, well, she her representative, uh, opportunities to give written submissions? And so they didn't say that an oral hearing was necessary. Exactly. But you remember why? I don't expect you to remember this. We'll cover it. We'll cover it next class. What did, what did Baker admit? That she was here illegally. Sorry? That she was here illegally. Yeah, that she was here illegally. Mm -hmm. So the court said, you're already here illegally. 
you're entitled to this one last hope. Maybe getting the, the minister to allow you to stay anyway. So that's media. If this was about whether she was here legal or, legally or illegally, mm -hmm. high fairness, almost without a doubt. Which is why the IRB hearings look very court-like. Because uh, a high degree of fairness suggests a court-like process. But remember, that's rare, because not all cases are about something so serious as your right to, to uh, remain in Canada, right? And I, I like the boat license example because it really is the opposite end of the spectrum. My, you know, my recreation. There's almost nothing at stake. Right? So those are the two extremes, low and high. Baker ends up in the middle because of this situation she was in where she was already breaking the law. It was clear. But should she be allowed as a discretionary decision to stay in Canada? So they say medium. And what did medium mean? No oral hearing. You know, her lawyer said, oh, she was entitled to an oral hearing. And they said, no. No, not under medium. You don't get an oral hearing under medium. You do under high, probably. But not under medium. So the written hearing was sufficient. Anybody remember why she she uh, was successful? Bias. Yeah. Yeah. All the caps. Awful stereotyping. Yeah. You know, racist uh, kind of uh, uh, comments made. Uh, by the hearing officer. Yeah. So they said bias. Bias is fatal. So remember, on the, on the procedural fairness side, when we have a fatal procedural error like that, like a unacceptable bias, well, it's fatal. The decision cannot stand. And that's what happened there. And what did the court do? My favorite word? Quash. And send it back. That's what happened to me. Anybody know what the outcome was? Yeah. Yeah. There was a new hearing. Yeah. And uh, the new decision maker said she can stay. So she stayed. It's a, you know, I really, Baker is probably the most important procedural fairness case that we have. He gave us the template that I'm not going to throw at you today. But it's the five factors to determine how much procedural fairness anybody is entitled to in any given case. After the five factors were looked at, it ended up with median. But still, because of bias, game over. But if it weren't for bias, you know, it might have. Uh, have been a different outcome. Yeah, it's a triple sort of prong bias, as I recall. I mean, bias with regard to race, bias with regard to her mental capacity, and then really this elitist thing that she's just a domestic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There were, you're right, there were layers of bias, for yeah. sure. And she'd be a drain mm -hmm. on the system probably forever. Right. Yeah. But one of her key arguments failed, the, the key argument about the law entitled to an oral hearing. That surprised a lot of people. Yeah. Um, but it's very instructive for us in how we approach future problems. Um, and I'll just say this, there's a tendency for students to say, like, you want to say high, you know, oh, this should be high procedural fairness. Don't, don't be trapped by that. A lot of cases, even cases that you might say, well, that's kind of serious, don't end up with a high level procedural fairness, they end up immediate. You know, high is kind of reserved for the really, really serious cases. Okay? And oral hearing is one of the key procedural benefits that you can argue for that you didn't get. <coughs> and um, the, the baker says, and other cases say, 
you know, oral hearing, most people are not entitled to an oral hearing, except in, you know, these, these high procedural fairness cases. So again, a lot of students say, oh, you know, my client was, or lawyers, my client was entitled to an oral hearing. For the most part, courts say, no, they weren't. We're going to let, in other words, we're going to let DMs have written hearings. There's nothing wrong with a written hearing. Written hearings are fine. What would you argue, how would you argue against that? What's the inherent weakness of a, of a written hearing? I don't expect you to know this. Well, so you might know it. Cross examine. <clears throat> yeah, cross examination. Basically, the cases say where where credibility is an issue. Uh, he said, she said. Credibility. It's not always an issue, but if it's an issue, um, oral hearings may be required. But the next side of uh, written hearings is that in every class, the issue of access to justice comes up, and courts are strained, and backlog, and blah, blah, blah. And so having and desiring a oral, an oral hearing for every single thing, that just compounds it. You know, so you're almost faced in some cases where you can say, you know what, written maybe lacks something, but we can get it done in six months or a year that's instead exactly, of five years. No, that's right off. That's right off. So yeah, you might you might say, well, why shouldn't we expect oral hearings from all DMs? It's exactly that. The courts say if we hold all DMs up to the highest standards of fairness and expect them to have an oral hearing, the whole system's gonna collapse. And again, that's the court showing respect for a DM's decision that, you know what, we need to do written hearings because they're faster, they're more efficient. And we can't, op we can't run this system if we have oral hearings in every case. We've got, we've got, to, do, we've got to be creative and have different kinds of hearings uh, in order to give people access to justice so they would, instead of waiting five years for, for a hearing, maybe they wait six months. So at least they get, you know, they get an outcome. Um, and written hearings are very good, a very good way to speed things up. My office does written hearings and they work quite well and they can be perfectly fair. These people have an opportunity, you know, to make submissions, <coughs> make arguments, all of that stuff. Uh, but yeah, you do see a lot of people want to say, oh, an oral hearing is required. You know, that was a procedural fairness um, problem. Well, in most cases, the court's going to say, no. no. We don't expect oral hearings, except in unusual cases. Okay. I thought somebody else had a question. But anything? So yeah, we're, we're meeting again next week, and we're gonna go much deeper into procedural fairness. And I think the class after that, which is, we have several weeks off, next class in October, and then I think that'll be close to the end of procedural fairness. But we're spending a lot of time on it. There might be one more class. So procedural fairness is um, really taking up a big chunk of our time. Uh, because of how important it is, how complicated it is. Uh, but again, as I was saying before, I'm going to give you that template that's going to walk you through in order the questions you ask on procedural fairness. And like with almost everything, you start with the statute, right? Because your procedural fairness problem might be answered right there in the statute or right there in a code of procedure. Usually not. Then you go to the common law and uh, there's a... Um, in the template, it tells you how to go through the common law analysis for procedural fairness. Okay, look at that. Before that, I thought we'd go to die.
All right, thank you guys. I know it's, there's a lot that was.